here. It's not all I think, to tell you the truth. Ed really is thrilled to have uh, Bob Callahan doing this presentation for us. And I just want to give you a little insight into how seriously our presenters take this. Bob has read the book. He's underlined. He's, we're just talking about something, and he showed me the book is, you know, it's underlined. He's reread it a couple of times. Um, he reduced his notes, he told me, to four pages. Uh, I don't know what it started at, but, it, but it's... So yeah. everybody takes this, you know, seriously, and, and I just want to make sure you recognize that. There's nothing you have to do, but it just, it, it, and I, I appreciate the effort that he put into it. Uh, and Bob has a, a connection. Uh, his father was in the OSS in China in World War II contemporaneously wow. with, with NATO. Wow. So it's, uh, he has a little bit, they never yeah. met, but uh, he has some, some insights, I think, that'll be, you know, give us a juice this up a little bit. Not that he needs to juice it up, but thanks, Bob. <laughs> you, you, you bet. I just think, John, I were just saying uh, in Appendix 1 that you all saw there's a list of hundreds of inventions that the Chinese made. Mm -hmm. It just you know, boggles the mind how much mm -hmm. went on and need went on to discover this. So if I'm not loud enough, let me know and I'll mm -hmm. I'll speak up. I'll try to use my mm -hmm. my broadcasting voice to to pump it out here. But uh notes. Mm -hmm. This is a commercial interruption. <laughs> you, you have to have a commercial uh, okay the opener is i just want to thank edna who started the whole thing edna is the queen of this and i want to just thank you so much for doing this has gone on all these years and thank you i also want to thank uh joe estes because no. joe uh, asked me to lead a discussion a few years back. It was, it was a book called The Emerald Mile. It was a wild, wonderful, oh, that was a very exhilarating uh, book uh, about shooting the Grand Canyon way back in 1983 by three guys uh, mm -hmm. after a huge flood. And they did it in three and a half days in a little wooden dory. It was an incredible book. But then thanks to John O'Neill, when John called me and asked me if I'd lead a discussion, he said, do you have a book in mind? And like all of you, I read a lot. And I had a few. But he said, by the way, I just finished reading this book, A Man Who Loved China. And I said, well, what's that about? And he, he, he told me. And I said, that sounds intriguing. And I have to say, uh, The Man Who Loved China is even more wild and wonderful and exhilarating than The Animal Mile, which I, I, I love to hear. <laughs> this book was incredible. It's, it's dense. It's thick. It's chock full of um, just amazing um, uh, things that happen, discoveries, exploration, politics, war, love. Uh, oh, it's just, it's an incredible, uh, incredible book. I, I'd sum it up this way. I would say it's a love story. And, and I'm not a romantic fool or anything, but I, I do think this is a love story. And Joseph Needham's love of life, love of learning and scholarship in particular, love of women, he really <laughs> loved the woman, yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially his <laughs> Dorothy uh, and Lu Gui Jin, his mistress, and then very late on, his, his, his wife. He loved science. He loved wild dancing, singing, and I don't think he was particularly good at either one of them. Yeah. They had a, a some mm -hmm. saying saying, if you dance with Joseph, watch your toes if. And so, <laughs> it, but he loved doing it. Um, he loved the robes. He loved dressing up. He loved art, architecture, trains, planes, automobiles, especially the really fast ones. He was an amazing speeder <laughs> and boats. He, he loved religion, including Jesus, Buddha, Confucius, a Muslim, yeah. uh, keen <laughs> sense of justice, Naked freedom. He was a nudist. Uh, uh, music, uh, discovery, and exploration. He loved people, yeah. and he loved to be loved. He was a very social man. You you see and read about his um, time at Cambridge College, the the Keys College, in particular in Cambridge, and he just loved that adulation and everything that he got. He especially loved China, and uh, he wanted to tell the world about it, which he did via the book, the, the, the volumes and volumes of book 18 that he put out called Science and Civilization in China. And it, and it became then 24 
volumes. It was 15,000 pages. Uh, he died in 1985 at the age of 95. And at that point, it was 15,000. Um, and here, I'll just take a brief intermission to tell you what happened to me when I was about 10 years old. I was in grade school and studying geography. And um, I was asking my father about China. And he was, as, as John said, a spy over in China and Vietnam for two years. He's pulled out of Harvard. He was proficient in language and was a spy over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he told me that we were asking about China. And he said, the Chinese are fantastic. They're smart. They're inquisitive. They're uh, creative. They have a great sense of humor. And they will probably take over the world. Yeah. And I was 10. And I said, Dad, that's ridiculous. You know, they're they're red commies. These are bad guys. And he said, they're not, they're not that bad. Uh, and he went on to explain a little bit, but I was 10 and, and, and that was that. And so that shaped as as I read this book, as John mentioned, that he was over there at the same time. His simple mission was to find ammo where the Japanese had invaded one third of the country. Uh and had ammo depots down in Vietnam as well as in China. So that that really was curious because, like uh, Joseph Needham, Dad met all the people running the show there, which was uh, Chiang Kai Shek, the Nationalist Party, Joe jo and Lai, uh, Mao, uh, Say Tung, and and so all these people were players that uh, they were, you know, trying to save their country against Japan. Meanwhile, they're fighting e each other. Mm -hmm. So I'll, um, I'll just give some snippets. I, I talked to a lot of people that couldn't come today, including my own wife, by the way. Uh, she, she went <laughs> up to take care of her mom in Connecticut, <clears throat> but they got through uh, either all of it and were fascinated and overwhelmed or half of it. And so I just want to tell you all, a bit what intrigued me and I think shaped the story of this, which I think was a love story of all those mm -hmm. things I mentioned. He was a, Joseph was the only child. He had a bad marriage, uh, a London doctor, and a quote, uh, flame haired Irish woman, Alicia Adele Montgomery. Uh, she had uh, an artistic temperament, wild, childlike exuberance. Uh, she was erratic, plate throwing at her husband, in particular, psychic, and uh, read tarot cards. And I thought that was interesting because you see where Joseph goes in this all over the place. He has his scientific part, his love part, his socialist part, his nudist part. I mean, the guy is exactly. very eclectic, is, is, yeah. is a word that yeah. comes to mind. His father, the, the, the mom and dad did not get along well. So much so that when he was born, he had four names like many English folks, and his father called the baby Noel, the mother called the baby Terence, and then when he got to know himself, he decided to call himself Joseph. So that, that just shows you some of the things. There was, uh, they were a strict family, but loving, uh, tidy chores, they did uh, strict chores, never go up the stairs without picking something up. We all heard that from our, our folks. Um, he learned languages early on, uh, he was, as a schoolboy, he dissected 12,000 animals, uh, and then he inspected the anatomy of 800 stillborn babies, which is, you know, bizarre, yeah. but uh, he was definitely on the road to no, be... Uh, studying uh, embryology. Yeah, and yeah. on the road to be a surgeon. So um, in 1914, the war, World War One breaks out. He goes to a prep school, uh, Andal. Joe, am I pronouncing that right? Yeah. Yeah. And apparently a very good school. Headmaster was very influential uh, to him. He said to, to, to Joseph and all the other students, think uh, glacial, glacially. Think big. The, the world is not that big. You have to think big. The world is small. Um, he also, they taught him early on the sympathy of the working class. So he got his socialist roots early on from prep school and then well on into Cambridge. Uh, the Bolshevik Revolution happened in 2017. Uh, one of his professors just said, it, the, this revolution is a jolly good thing. So uh, again, he was influenced very much. In, in 1918, 
Uh, he got the Spanish flu pandemic, very <coughs> time repeat, wow. history repeats itself. Yeah. Uh, he was a very shy guy at first till he kind of came out. Uh, mm -hmm. He abandoned his boyhood uh, ambition to become a surgeon after a professor said, a surgeon is just someone who saws bones. He wanted to do more than that. He said, the future, my boy, lies with atoms and molecules. So he found, uh, he found chemistry. Um, he gets his degree. His father sadly dies early. He needs a father figure. He finds this guy, Hopkins, in the lab. And Hopkins is wonderful to him and, and is very influential. Um, he becomes a nudist in 1920. Uh, and yet, at the same time, he wants to become very spiritual, uh, and he doesn't think there's a, there's a conflict there. Uh, and he seeks spirituality through a lay brother's Anglo-Catholic monastic organization called the Good Shepherds. So I don't know this organization, but uh, there you go. He enrolled, and then he didn't last long because he found out one of the rules was celibacy. And again, he <laughs> always loved the women. And so oh. that was not going to work, and it did not work. Then all of a sudden, he met an attractive uh, biochemistry student, uh, Dorothy, also known as uh, Delphi. Uh, Del Dophi. Uh, five years his senior. They married in 1924. But the marriage, at the marriage, it, it said, this will be a modern marriage, not to be hobbled by the tedious, irksome, thoroughly bourgeois, demands of sexual fidelity. <laughs> Which, yeah, imagine if someone said this at the chapel. Well. Was he running for president? <laughs> he will not be bound by this. <laughs> and they agreed to that. And, and as you all know, reading the book, uh, that, that came to fruition many, many, many times. He loved Cambridge and particularly Keyes uh, College. Uh, um, Let's see. He had a photographic memory. He wrote his own first book when he was 25 years old. Uh, he found a liberal church, an uh, Anglican church, and he, he and Dopey loved it. So he was happy with that. He also was introduced to dancing, something called Morris dancing, which I didn't know anything about, but apparently it's folk with its roots in the Muslim world way yes. back when. But again, a prolific dancer not particularly good one. He was 6'4", a little gawky, but he loved to dance and would do it any time. Uh, dabbled in the left wing, the British Labour Party. Uh, he had friends like uh, A.E. Milan, H.G. Wells, and a guy named Kim Philby. And Kim Philby, as a lot of you know, is a, one of probably the most famous uh, spy in, in MI6 and many great books about, about uh, uh, Philby. Um, Joe, in 39, he meets uh, Lu Weijian, who is a biochemistry um, student from China, and that changed his life. And Lu really introduces him to China, uh, Chinese history, um, writing Chinese, and then he learned Mandarin. Right away, he just attacked it, mm -hmm. fell deeply in love with her. She became his mistress and his muse for life. And, uh, and it, it was amazing. That got him going over to China. He, he saw what happened, the atrocities of the war as Japanese, Japan took over the Eastern third of China. Uh, uh, Lu explained to Joseph what was going on over there. In uh, England, nor the United States was doing anything about it. And Joseph was incensed and he was campaigning uh, about that. He finally got through Churchill the orders that he could go over there to protect colleges and institutions from the treachery of the, uh, the Japanese who were really getting rid of a lot of academia, great books, etc. He did an 8,000 mile trek from Cambridge by train, boat, plane, via the Li Lisbon, Malta, Suez Canal, <coughs> Bombay, around India, the Port of Calcutta, Hopped over the Himalayas in a Douglas C-47. I mean, this is a treacherous journey. My dad actually ended up doing almost the same journey. He didn't hop over the Himalayas, which he did a, a different route in the final thing. But it was a hairy thing. Uh, he, uh, the, the knowledge that we had, the Western world, we, uh, England, the United States, at that point, even though we knew great things that happened there, was pretty limited. 
uh, we knew from Marco Polo, we knew from the Jesuits that had done missions over there, but they did not know China. They knew about uh, pagodas, they knew rice, they knew tea, they knew palaces, uh, silk, ivory chopsticks, incense, porcelain, all this stuff. The Jesuits, but they thought it was a vast land um, and kind of a backwater country. Um, also knew we did the West that in 1911, as quote with the sudden suddenness of gallows, ancient China Empire fell. And that was ended up being the Needham question. How did that happen? Why did it happen? And it, it fell and, and no one knew exactly what was going on. Fast forward to 1937, Japan, who had long been subordinate for centuries and centuries to China, they invade. And uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson at the time called uh, China a booby nation, a backwater nation. And that's what we kind of thought uh, going into it. Um, let's see, 37, 1937, 1940, China's getting throttled by the Japanese. Uh, and and they, they were brutal. The stories that, that oh, this book God. does not go into, you all have read in other books, they were just, they were just brutal. Uh, uh, and, but the United States, as I mentioned, and England remain neutral. Joseph got apoplectic about this. In 39, uh, Joseph Needham needs to go to China. He gets the, the permission through Churchill. Pearl Harbor happens. And the reason why he got the permission, by the way, he was just so pugnacious about saving them in terms of academia. That was his mission, just on the academic part. He wasn't going to be a spy. He wasn't going to be a military guy. He was just trying to go over there and save what was centuries of great academia that they wanted to, to protect. Finally, Churchill did it. And a lot of people said, Needham's not the guy. Needham doesn't know the history of China. He's not a historian and he's not a, a intellect on, on China either. But he became that on his own, just digging, 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 learn Mandarin, et cetera. Et cetera. Uh, he was selected to lead. Uh, he, he knew that uh, he would get there and it would be very tough. Uh, he, he meets, as soon as they're over there, uh, when he lands in 43, he meets right away Zhou Enlai and Mao. And, and they were the communists. Uh, and then also he ends up meeting Chiang Kai-shek, which basically sponsored this expedition that he was on. So he had to be more loyal to Chiang Kai-shek, even though his own philosophy leaned to the left more towards socialism and, and communism. He wasn't sure communism was right, but he, he leaned that way socially. Uh, he also knew, and Chiang Kai-shek told him, that our mission is A, to hold off Japan. But at that point, Chiang Kai-shek was thinking, um, I don't worry too much about Japan. We're too vast. I don't think we're going to be able, uh, that Japan's going to be able to get to us. And obviously they were not. Uh, and then when England and the United States came into it, there was no way. His bigger mission at that point, and Joseph knew it, was to defend from Mao and Zhou Enlai and the, the communist. Um, so his mission was simply the Sino-British Science Cooperation, which was the academic thing. And his second one, as soon as he landed, he knew he wanted to do a book and, and tell the world, basically tell the world that the West did not know that the East was <clears throat> best. They were smarter than we were. They were more advanced than we were. And the West, including the best academic institutions in England, in France, throughout Europe and the United States, just thought, oh, uh, These 11 missions <laughs> covered a couple of years and 30,000 miles. So the United States is 3,000 miles coast to coast. This is, you know, this is 10 times uh, doing this on really bad trucks that kept breaking down, uh, motorcycles, boats, all kinds of stuff. And he, he saw some terrible things. Um, 
each each mission had four uh, official goals. One was to spread good cheer uh, to the Chinese, particularly to the Chinese scientific community. The second was to boost morale uh, it, where they needed goods and equipment. He was their version of Santa Claus, and he would come and say, I will get you microscopes and things like this. It was very hard, but he did, and he, he worked it hard. The third was to wave the British flag and he, why did he do that just for the future? When the war is over, the Brits wanted in and, and, and be uh, tight allies with the Chinese. The fourth was to keep an eye and ear out on the communists. Again, Joseph was already sort of half communist himself, so he wasn't a particularly good guy. He certainly did not think of himself as a spy because he was a scientist and he always wanted to remain neutral. But nonetheless, that's what they asked him to do. Officially, he was on the missions accredited by Chiang Kai-shek. Interestingly enough, they said China is a vast plateau, much like you say, well, what's Florida like, the geology, the topography? Florida is a big swamp, and I'm on the board of national parks. I love it, but it's a big swamp. It's beautiful, and birds and animals and everything, but that's what this is. There, they say it's China's a huge plateau that kind of meanders west to east, so all the, the rivers and that, that came into effect. He met this guy named Rue Alley that you all will remember from the book, who was quite a character. Uh, he was a writer, an educator, a potter. He was from New Zealand. He was sort of a short, stubby man. He was a member of the Communist Party. He, he was gay. He was also a, a, a nudist, but he came up with this idea, working with the Chinese, called CIC, the Chinese uh, Industrial Cooperation. And that was anytime they bombed a factory, he organized the Chinese so fast and they went out and built another factory out of anything and really helped defeat, defeat Japan. He was an incredible guy. Anyway, they, they go on and talk about it. I thought it was in interesting. Um, Chinese uh, fighting was not simple. Uh, again, Joseph's was smart and England was smart to keep the missions mostly going west <clears throat> to keep out of the east where a third was occupied by Japan and they didn't want to get involved. He obviously did get involved as you go through the book and came close to death a couple of times. But the fighting was complex. It's Japan versus China, the big one. But then there was also the nationalists versus the communists. They didn't trust each other at all and were jockeying for who was going to take control. The warlords, lords within themselves, and there were a lot of warlords, uh, the tribal rivals, and there were a lot of tribes, the Russian invaders coming from the north, and the Russians were very eager to take a piece, and the frontier folks. So a lot of things going on. Um, Needham saw atrocities, he saw torture, he had terrible nightmares, and he was a very you know, thoughtful, sensitive guy on the one hand, um, and he just had, he was plagued by nightmares the whole time. He, he was over there. He, when they went on these missions and found the caves and the history and the scrolls, uh, he, he was just blown away, as was everyone when this volume of books came out. Uh, they found the Diamonds uh, Sutra. His faithful companion, H.T., was one of his, the reasons he made the, the trip so successfully. He had so many good people he ended up adoring over there because they were faithful and showed them the culture and everything else over there. Uh, he loved the fauna, the flora. He loved animals, and he studied southern Chinese birds. I mean, he just was an amazing character. He escaped to the south, had to get over a key bridge before it was going to be blown up, and he knew the, the, the Japanese were advancing, were about to blow up this bridge. And he was such a cool guy under fire that he and H.T., his faithful assistant, were on a truck, on the back of a truck. They had to kind of hitchhike because their, their truck blew, down, blew, uh, blew up. He's on the back of this truck, stalls in the middle of the bridge, the suspension bridge, and they're about to blow it up. And he said, well, we can't do anything. Let's have some tea and a cigar. They had oh. tea and a cigar and <laughs> fell asleep. And the next morning, four in the morning, <laughs> like, okay, we fixed it, let's go. They get over the bridge. And about a few hours later, boom, the, the, the bridge goes up. Uh, the, the Needham question comes up. They call it the Needham question. 
which is very intriguing, and I'd really like to get you all your, your thoughts in, in just a bit, is if China is so clever, it's so inquisitive, it's so creative, what happened back when? What stalled everything? Uh, the, the, it, they're just not sure what did it, what made things stall. There's a Chinese expression saying, the, the dogs may bark, but the caravan, caravan moves on. The, the movement moved on, but it just stalled. It wasn't, the, the Chinese weren't their creative intellectual uh, selves for 1911, way up into like the 1960s, uh, in the 70s. Um, anyway, the mission was over in China after he did all these explorations, 30,000 miles worth. I uh, came back and divided these two books, these volumes and volumes of history into two books, he called them, the heavenly volumes and the earthly volumes. But one was about geography, which was the intro. One was about philosophy. One was about pre-science, which is math, astronomy, geology, physics, botany, alchemy, zoology, etc. The next one was about <clears throat> technology. Uh, the next one was more about the Needham question. Um, the next one was discovering what other countries were doing at the same time or in parallel to China. And then the, the last one was about China's future. Where are they going? And he, he had the insight, the foresight to think like this. Are they really going to be a big player or, or not? Uh, there was the chapter on persona non grata. Uh, that, that you all will remember. And that he almost did himself in. Uh, once he went back to Cambridge to do his, his work on uh, uh, another mission they asked him to do, uh, he was also asked to go back to China to look if the Americans really did a terrible thing, which is during the Korean War, did we in fact do molecular uh, biochemical warfare and actually drop little moles like mice infected out of an airplane and insects to to really kill the the north koreans and people through all kinds of allegations against the united states about this they tried to get an academic team of scientists to go over to prove in fact that the Americans, the nasty Americans did this, uh, and it was a nasty type of warfare. Uh, they duped him, and he was such a bright guy, you know, didn't suffer fools. But his scientific friends in China and some at Cambridge convinced him to do this mission, and he took it on and went over there. And uh, it, when I read the chapter, it just kind of takes your breath away because you think, how could this brilliant guy be duped on this so much? But he was. <clears throat> he was uh, duped by the scientists about that warfare. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, did they drop more? No, 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 no. Turns out they did this study. They called him a traitor. They called him a stooge. They called him an Ishmael. I've never heard that derogatory term, but <laughs> it means a traitor. <clears throat> you can use that in your day-to-day -day life if you want. Ishmael. Uh, call me Ishmael. Yeah, oh, <laughs> it's just okay. just call me at home. Right? But and Joe McCarthy was present here in the United States, and all that was going on. So he was obviously he's, he was uh, black blacklisted at Cambridge, which just killed him. A blacklisted in the United States, he could not come to the United States, and many academic institutions wanted him to come and talk. He could not, but he did end up recovering. Once his books went out, he realized he had been duped. And this is another question for you all. Why do you think he was? Uh, I think he just loved these Chinese scientists and thought they were genuine when they said America really did this. And what I think they got hoodw hoodwinked by the communist government. But anyway, I'd love to get your thoughts. He, a couple of other quick outtakes is that when he went back to do this study, which was flawed, uh, he did meet Mao again, and Mao said, uh, Joseph, he called him by his Chinese name, said, I have a question for you, because I'm trying to keep things uh, very simple for the common person. Should we move on to the combustible engine and do cars here, or should we keep it with bicycles? 
And uh, he said, you know, bikes versus car. Needham told Mao that back in Cambridge, where I spend most of my time now, my very old bike is perfectly satisfactory. So Mao said, right then, bicycles it is. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Mao kept bicycles for the next six years. And then, <laughs> then, then, then cars came. Uh, he gave now away, we're I, returning to bicycles. We are, I know. I know. Uh, when people went to Cambridge, particularly <laughs> this Keys College, they went through the gate of uh, humility because you're all not as smart as you should be when you're a, a freshman and coming in when you die and only a few people did this and they gave him this honor it was called the gate of honor and he received that dorothy his wife died uh in 1992 uh i'm sorry dorothy died at 19 years dorothy of age. the first one and the wild one she um the irish one no that is his mother oh, that is mother. his oh, mother God. okay God. yeah dorothy was the biochemist that he fell in love with and stayed with his whole life but also had a mistress and the three of them were good friends and, and it was a open he's probably thing. glad that he had a mistress but Dorothy died in 92. Uh, Joe marries Lu Gui Jin in 89, his mistress of all those years. So he mm -hmm. never would marry her till it, if Joe his Dorothy wife died. died. Yeah, but after, after he she died, job? she tries to marry three other people. Right. Yeah. And by the way, all the three others that he proposed to after Lu sure. dies, Joe's right. After they were all Asians, so we had he had a love for Asian women. And he, Did he, he have a child by his mistress? No, he had, too bad. he had no no children. Uh, he, then he so took smart. He he took one Friday off. He worked so all the way to till his death and stayed in Keys College at, mm -hmm. in Cambridge, and they gave him a beautiful spot there That's and everything. Great. One Friday, they said he was ill. I said, you, you really should take Friday off. And he never wanted to take any days off. But he said, OK, I'll take this one day off. They got two beautiful girls to come be his attendant. And he could see still. And he was very happy, uh, held their hands, grinned, and died. And oh, that, oh that, that uh, was, you know, that's good night. made up. That whole good way to go. Well, it, 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 it could be, but it's, it's in the book, it's, it's fact. So, yeah. uh, and there's a plaque there in the college, which is, is terrific. It says, The man departs, there remains his shadow, meaning he is yeah. such a scholar. You have a yeah. you, you have this here. So, the epilogue, and this gets into uh some really i think intriguing questions i want to throw out the epilogue is china has changed uh and when the book ended it, it was uh, i i saw john it was written in 2008 right right so you have to keep that in context but they said china has changed so much since joseph went over there in 43 uh chongqing where he originally was is now the most populous city in China with a population in this city of 38 million, million people. Yeah. 38 million people. Mm -hmm. And he said, the difference now is you go over there and you're being watched everywhere. And I've been to China a few times and mm -hmm. it, the difference between my 20 year gap when I went back, you, you really can see that. Uh, 800 babies are born every day in this city, 500 die every day. That has changed as of two days ago. It was headlines in the, the papers. Wait a minute. Know. Not 500 babies die every day. People. No, I'm sorry. 500 people die. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and um, <laughs> now that has changed. So th this is something they have to work on. More people are dying that are, than are being born. Mm -hmm. um, the gap between rich and poor over there, I mean, over the world, it's quite a gap. But over there, it's really terrible. Mm -hmm. The pollution. Uh, around the world is tough. In China, it's the worst. India yeah, is right, a, a, a right. close second. Yeah. We could be better for sure, but uh, it's terrible there. Um, still, it's a self, they still possess a self-knowing superiority sense of uh, uh, inner yes. certitude that they are definitely the best in the world. They have that spirit about them. Yeah, but after yeah. centuries of uh, science, technology, creativity, everything ground to halt. So this is the Needham question. And 
why do you all think after reading the book, it did grind to a halt? What what did this and any other questions you all want to uh, bring up? Bob, are you raising your hand? I didn't raise my hand, but what happened was Mao was running the country. And uh, could you speak up play. a little bit, please? I said Mao was running the country for 30 or 40 years, so he had no interest in intellectuals. He had no interest in business. All he wanted to do was you know, have an agricultural economy. There was no government support of capitalism, as it were, which eventually came along in a form of business growing in China, which brought them a wealthier economy. But during Mao's term, until this, I forget who the immediate successor was, there was no interest in, in growing the manufacturing or any business or yeah. so so but it goes much it much goes much that is a, a reason of, of late. Yeah, but it goes much deeper than that. And his question is the seminal question is how was this country that developed all of these incredible ideas, right? Printing all the things that we took credit for in the West, right? They did hundreds of years before right. we did. How did they lose that along the way so that for 200 or 300 years, they were in the dark? That's sort of the question. It's not just since 1911 mm -hmm. when the communists took over. It was before that. 1500 AD. Yes, yeah. Right? Yeah. Exactly. So, so the question you know, is, I have you know, uh, two, two things that I thought through on that. One, because I read the book, if anyone here has read it, 1421, which is yeah. the which is yeah. the book of sailing the Chinese when yeah. they had the old imperial um, emperor sailed around the world. They settled in places, at least they say they settled. I mean, the Navajo language has a, the DNA there. They've got, you know, in in uh, Rhode Island, they, they settled, they settled. They know that they went all the way to Europe and they had these, they had this, the, the best, fleet in the world you yeah. know but after they did that that was it the next emperor came in and said we're shutting it down we're looking inward but why do, what why did he do it i mean it's during the renaissance it's because they had lost they lost it was a huge amount of time and energy to focus on the outside rather than the inside and so the, the next guy who came along and i don't know i can't remember yeah. who the emperor was said we're going to think a little bit more about our own selves rather than going, and, and they always were a little bit, I mean, Marco, Marco Polo, I mean, it was the hidden empire, but they at one point were thinking yeah. of, of going, of going out. This, the second thing that I, that I would say is the Europeans came in and colonialized a great part of it. Mm -hmm. they, that was a backward movement for China. I mean, they yeah. were, you know, were not thought of as, as equal equals right. anywhere. Right. And you know, today, even to the point of I'm sure there are Chinese to think is our kids here take fentanyl and die as a drug of what happened with the opium dens yeah. that were encouraged in mm -hmm. colonial China. <laughs> um and and you know that sort of the parallel is out there that um okay West, we're on a new and I think they are on a totally new track in terms okay. of globalization, which they haven't been on you know, for a long yeah. time. And part of it, then that goes back to what Bob's argument was, which yeah. is they, you know, that of recent history, they have been oriented totally towards economy and and modern types of objectives. Yeah. In terms but of I think there's a question here that did they just stop or do they actually regress? Because if I remember correctly, and I haven't read any of this in recent years, but when Admiral Perry and, and, and so forth, and, and the Western countries started going to, to China, we overwhelmed them with our weaponry, or the West overwhelmed them. So they had invented gunpowder centuries before. Right. They had invented all, you know, all the projectile stuff and so forth. And yet there were easy pickings when the West showed up. Yeah. Uh, and, and so they didn't just halt. I think they went backwards mm -hmm. and, and, you know, Think about that, and that's, mm -hmm. that's pretty remarkable. What happened in the two centuries before the West showed up? Yeah, they went from you know doing all this stuff, you know, building these fantastic bridges and and, and inventing all these things, and and we showed up, and and they were backward when we showed up. Well, I, I think John, that goes a little bit to what Bob's saying is but that yeah, talking about they, they said we one of the answers they threw out, just throwing out answers in the book was. 
they simply stopped trying. Yeah. Uh, the mm -hmm. communisms caused it, they said. And this is one of the arguments they, they just made. Students' ambition yeah. was just to join the bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. Mediocracy yeah, right. became yeah. the norm. Right. <laughs> and they thought, get in line, pay attention. And then it, the curiosity mm -hmm. was, was quelled. Mm -hmm. They never had the power of capitalism. Yes. <clears throat> yeah. But it yeah. happened way before then. Yeah, and the, I mean, the, 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 the king guy. It's years. related to salmon disease. Well, they're, they're huge famine, so they lost 8 million but, people. In so Europe lost 70 million for you know, plague in, 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 yeah, in but, the plague. Yeah, but Joe, they, they do point out in, in the book that the the warlords that went on they were just destroying each other mm -hmm. so that did happen internal, they had internal like fighting yeah. big internal I mean it's a huge country with all kinds of fightums this is sort of like the Middle East Jeff yeah I I was thinking about it too um, I don't think anything has really changed in China you, know? you talk a little louder Jeff? yeah I don't think things have really changed in China um, in that there's always been an extremely centralized governing force in China. You know, be it an emperor or right, you know, right. the, the Chinese Communist Party. And, you know, the emperors liked it the way it was. And they thought that if, you know, opening up the country to outside influences could, you know, pollute things, there's probably some, you know, egotism where the best and, you know, there is. And they just, Walled off things and you know, it's a threat of capitalism. Power. I mean, Ned <laughs> took some of us to uh, Egypt <clears throat> this summer. It was very, it was very similar. We asked the same question in Egypt because I mean, they're similar to China, and you, you come away from there if you've been there saying, Oh my god, you know, what all the things they did, and their, their hieroglyphic history goes back 5,000 years, you know. AD, you know, what happened there? Well, one of the things that happened was that for 400 years, which coincided with the European Renaissance, education was outlawed, unless it was religious education, because again, the pharaohs had a good thing going. They just wanted to keep it the way it was. I think it's kind of as simple as that. Ultimately, it gets down to governance. Yeah. You have to think that it's governance. You know, but wasn't there a great deal of turmoil during this period in China where they were fighting each other uh -huh. as opposed mm -hmm. to the central government being totally in control? Yeah, it seemed like that's a great destruction. I mean, we yeah. see that in yeah. our own country now where everybody's banging in, yeah, right, right. But <clears throat> that means the central government was not able lost to lost control, exactly. Mm -hmm. They yeah. weren't in control, kind of like yeah. Congress. <laughs> but but they were having their own things like the con congress now we have our issues for sure but they were going back and forth quite a bit uh, and this she right now not to get us into politics but it, it's interesting this does you know uh kind of kick us in the tail saying what is next for china and xi jinping has announced that you know he's no more term limits he's been in for 12 years and mm -hmm. he's he's going going on they're very creative now they're very industrial and the, here's another question for for you all which remember the story that my father told me when i was 10 years old that they'll take over the world and i thought you know I, I always respected dad he was a great guy and he was really smart he spoke eight languages he remained a spy through his whole life in the CIA and um, and raised seven kids. And so he, I, I, I was a big fan of, of dad. But when he told me that uh, they were gonna take over the world, I just thought he had had one too many scotches or something. I thought, oh, they're, they're the commies, they're the bad guys. And when he said this, so the last line in the book is a sign as yeah. they're leaving yeah. China yeah. in that town, without, without, in that town, yes, and it says, "Without haste, without fear, we yeah. conquer the world." Yeah, that's right. right. That's, and my that's question scary. is: Do you all? <laughs> it's a little scary. <laughs> is do you all think that's the case yeah. in this interdependent world, or or not? But why would it be scary? <laughs> it's scary because the, the, the they're going to run back and forth. You're not always going to go up the ladder. There are going to be these latent periods 
I mean, it'll happen to the American population. I mean, I, 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 you just yeah. have to be realistic. Yeah. And, and the trouble is we need this broad study of history to comprehend that. Our view is so little narrow view of it. Mm -hmm. This definitely and also broadens the we're view. judging from a world that now can whiz across the world and not take how many months to go from China up to wherever they went. Why wouldn't they think, oh, why why are we bothering with this? We'll just look internally. Yeah. But if you just even it's the hard to read history in the last couple of decades, when Deng when Deng took over, right, um, he was he was taught about capitalism. Oh, yeah. And he believed in capitalism. He had um, and that coincided with the flourishing uh, of China and got to the point where we were all thinking that China was going to take over the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And under the new leadership, it's becoming more and more authoritarian and it's going toward Absolutely. central planning, which <laughs> is, I mean, particularly with people as entrepreneurial as the Chinese, yeah. having let the entrepreneurs Too go much, a month. Are. I mean, and yeah. they're fine, but as they have more and more central planning, we're starting to see cracks in the facade, and it looks like you know things aren't so so scary as, that, as looking at them as competitors. Yeah, and that's in a that's in a fairly short period of time. It, it, it has to do with governance. Yeah. They're very short. Just one personal example. I, I went over there in um, 2010 uh, to invest in a company called Alibaba that mm -hmm. many of you have heard of. It's a, it's a big company, and we were lucky to get involved with that. We said that. A, a, a town I had not been to. I was in Shanghai and took a fast train to Guangzhou, huge town, 11 million people. And ah, there's Alibaba. It looks like Google. It, it's like the Google <laughs> campus. It's so modern. Everything's going. And a guy named Jack uh, Ma, Ma yeah. was the CEO who we met during the investment. Where's event. Jack today? Jack, <laughs> that's the point, Joe. Jack, no one <coughs> knows where Jack, Jack no is longer. because yeah. now she is in a Jack go bye bye. And uh, so it's it's very scary how fast, as John's pointing out, things have changed there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's only a few years ago that Japan was going to take us over. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! Well, I found that you're now what you just quoted <clears throat> without uh, um, <clears throat> what was the first uh, without it's without fear and without right haste right uh, we will take over the world when you think of the United States we've been around a couple hundred years <laughs> they've been around for centuries. you know that's very uh, threatening to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They yeah. have a long view of history. Yeah. Also, uh, in the smaller nuclear idea, their families think generations beyond. Yeah. Like they think about their ch grandchildren and great grandchildren. How they? That's why they emigrate to Canada and America because they they think yeah. it's good. The uh, their population is also declining. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the culture of the uh, not average person, but the, of the Chinese, has to be very strong because if you think in, in throughout the world, there are Chinese communities, and those communities thrive economically. Yeah, right. And, you know, they're <laughs> you're it's right. True in the United capitalist. States, and, you know, they they come to the United States and they brought <laughs> their culture in the United States, and they are our most educated and becoming you know more and more successful. Yeah, and that's true. In Sri Lanka, it's true in, you know, everywhere in the world, there are places where there are Chinese communities. San Francisco. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, Sao well. Paulo, a huge amount of Chinese yeah. down in Sao Paulo. But anyway, I just think that's an interesting question of where it goes from here. It's, it's a quasi-political question. Back back to the, the book is, I just thought, Joseph Needham was incredible. I mean, what a fun character. And I don't think he was, uh, but my own personal view, I don't think he was a communist. When he went back to do that flawed investigation on the Americans, he did say in the book how it had changed. He used to love to dance and go out and very social. And the colors and everything else and the music, he said it had all kind of gone down. And, and it really bothered him. So I think he... He's not, I don't think he died a communist thinking they're in a good way. He wanted them to get back to their 
creative, entrepreneurial, artistic ways. I remember one of the reasons that he said that he had made the wrong decision was the fact that many of the intellectuals that he supported yes. were no longer there or allowed to speak and had been converted by the totalitarian government yes. to think as one. Well, and that's he right. was duped by these guys yeah. um, that were there eating, and he trusted them. And so the independence of academia, as he knew, knew it, didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I true. think that was a major problem with him understanding. He was hugely disappointed. I mean, yeah. yeah. I had a question for everybody here. Did you like the book? Did you have... Did you have uh scale of one to ten uh seven or lower yeah. hands okay eight nine i like it i'm just not through with it <laughs> yeah yeah okay I think I think he writes really well mm he's -hmm. got the sort of deal that you know, if you've read the one, the the one on the uh, Oxford Education Dictionary, the Madman and the yeah. Professor about Murray and right. the rest of them, I mean, yeah. he's got a bunch of these books that are all somewhat the same template, yeah. which is a lot of trivia around an idiosyncratic character, yeah. right. and they're kind of interesting. And he builds cases out of that that are are you know you could they're argumentative. Right? Yes, yeah, they're not. You I have to I sell your books. books. Remember, you have to sell yeah. them. Well, yes, yeah, people to read. You, there's another one about it, China. Seven or lower? Would you, are you six, five, four? Five. Five. Yes. Yeah. It wasn't bad. I read. What was the first one I ever read? Too much trivia. And I would enjoy hearing more about the accomplishments of way back when, the things he discovered. And I understand that was intentionally omitted, uh -huh. but that would have made the book much more interesting for me. Why was it intentionally mm -hmm. Sir? Why do you think it was intentionally omitted? Well, I think he was trying to tell the story of this individual, and uh, it was in it was at least in the appendix. But you know, you could have included a great deal more. Yes. I mean, you've taken away from the focus on this rather idiosyncratic individual. Yeah, I just think I guess my retort to that is that. There's just, I mean, this is pretty dense as it was, yeah. and some of the trivia, I just called it just really interesting facts. And I, as John said, I read it, I listened to it. The, the, by the way, the author reads it, he's a great reader yeah. too. Yeah. But if you go through the glossary, which we all did probably many times, you just like shaking your head how many things they invented. Yeah. And so I, I just don't think you could have spent that much time it was no, I, you couldn't you could write books about those yeah things, yeah not about this individual yeah. i could have used less bumping along and breaking down in trucks and, stuff, <laughs> and a little more yeah, uh, yeah. 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 yeah 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 i i did like the human side of him too yeah. and the, yeah. the flawed side of him and the dancing side and the womanizing yeah. and that well, yeah. I mean, just it just it made it an interesting yeah. thing. Right, right. Yeah. He wasn't just a boring scientist. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. I thought he was an interesting yeah. character. Well, I thought it was very dense <laughs> so in getting I. through it and so forth. But I feel it's a very important book. I think it'd be it would be great to have uh, high school students reading it and so forth and so on. I think it's important. <clears throat> For where we are in the world. Yeah. yeah. So, Edna, you're going to read the 18 volumes? <laughs> <laughs> One thing I'd like to ask, didn't see if he ever finished. You know, <clears throat> he was writing these books and writing them, and he didn't ever say that he finished. I believe. And then they finished up to 24. 24. I see. That <laughs> worked with After. 3 million words and 15,000 pages. That's correct. Yeah. So, <laughs> as a person who is picking these books, uh, what I'm hearing here is uh, maybe a, move the move the needle a little bit more toward the entertainment side and a little bit less toward you know this is a book you should read. Is that no, is that we, no. Have, we, no. Have, we should read no. books. We should read it's very you know <laughs> it stimulates yeah book, you know, right and this 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 was discussion. made you think we like okay. the discussion. Anybody want to comment on that, Jeff? Yeah. I like what's what made you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Bob, 
I'm still stuck back when the buildings were destroyed and they built them quickly. Right. How long did they last? You're always hearing about buildings collapsing. Oh, that, that New Zealander. Uh, he was just a crafty, smart, <laughs> pugnacious guy that uh, Needham met. And he started this thing and um, uh, he, he was, he sided with the communists. So once the war was over, Chiang Kai-shek just booted him out in, in a flash. But meanwhile, he was so clever uh, doing these things. There weren't long lasting, enduring factories, but he would come up and say, yeah. we, need, we need ball bearings. So mm -hmm. let's do it, we'll make it out of this. And he was just so amazingly clever. And he put up these factories all over the country. Yeah, in rural areas. In rural like areas. Little, mm -hmm. Yeah, many, many factories. Yeah. It was, it, it's where the expression, by the way, gung-ho comes from, which yeah. the Marines ended up using, right? That was a little trippy. Is that from the New Zealand guy, gung-ho? Yes. Yeah. 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 It's a, what I want to ask a personal question. At what age did your father reveal to you he was a spy and worked for CIA? That's a great question. Not when you were 10. No, 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 not at all. Or did he ever? Yes, he did. And it was, it was a great question. It was like pulling teeth to get it out of them. Uh, Dick, Dick knew my, my dad, and he was a, a, a great, great guy. My mom uh, had uh, lung cancer, and she had an eight-hour operation in New York City. I was working. I had a young family. And so I went over to be with dad because it was a tough operation. It was 50-50. And my younger brother came over too. So we wanted to be with dad. And so, so we have eight hours, dad. And, uh, and we know you're a spy because he, he had said something, but he said, well, I'm never talking about it. The code of silence. And now many years have passed. It, I don't think it was quite declassified, but many years have passed and everything. And we said, mom's going to be in this operation for eight hours. We've already said our prayers for her. She's in, in good shape, great doctors. Now um, you're going to spill. Give us, the, give us the news. And he said, I will not. Tell me how your family and kids are doing. How's work? And we said, family's good. Kids are fine. Work's great. What do you got? <laughs> and so finally, we wore him down. And he told us about the mission. And his was simply to find out where the ammo was. Now he had learned Mandarin and Vietnamese. So he went around, there's all kinds of people there. And his mission was two years cozying up. He was not uh, a James Bond type guy. He was not particularly athletic. My mom was, but uh, he was, he was. That mission got aborted, but he um, were your eyes as big as oh, yeah. house? and he told us these these things, and he <laughs> said, I, "I knew I was going to die. I wanted to marry your mom. We had dated before the war, but I was waiting till I got back." And so told us the story it was incredible. And then a follow up, kind of interesting. Last year, one of my brother's son got married to a gal. Is out in the North Fork of uh, Long Island, beautiful spot, a wine vineyard. And the marriage is going on and everyone's having fun. And this, the bride's aunt came up to me and said, Bob, I checked your family out. And I said, oh, good. Well, I hope we did okay. And she said, no, I'm with the CIA. And I said, okay, I still hope we checked out okay. And then she said, I'm just about to retire, but I found out your dad was one of us. And I said, yes, he was, it was in the OSS back in the war in China and Vietnam. And he goes, no, 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 he was not just there. And I didn't say just, but yeah. he said he was there, but he served his whole lifetime. And dad had since died. And uh, so he served and we never knew it. And oh, what he worked did for- Did your mom know? I think she did not. No. I think she did not. Cause he would go no. on missions all over the world, but he was an international business guy working for Phillips International out of Eindhoven. And then he'd be gone six weeks at a time. Uh, so we did not know that. And I'm still angry that you did or not, <laughs> not giving me that stuff. But he so he, he, no, he was sworn to see. Yeah. So that's when I found out, not till much later. Well, but reading this book, good. I was like, Dad, I wonder, you know. Wow. Oh. Great. Thank you, Bob. Thank you.
Yeah. So well done. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, hey, nice to meet you. Yeah, that was really yeah, that, that was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was in 1982. We, we tried a 